the code samurai but uh, well really that has nothing to do with what i'm going to talk about the subtitle is uh, much more explanatory it is a programming junkies guide to a quick coding fix uh, yeah so that is supposed to be richard stallman with two katanas if you don't get the joke don't fret over it okay so a brief history uh, in the beginning there was a big bang but no not that far a beginning and no soft kitties either um okay so to begin with a little bit about me and uh, why i am doing what i am doing uh i like linguistics and logic equally now you might say you know what's so special about that everybody does uh the special thing or the problem as it were is that i am equally good at both now why that suppo- uh, that tends to screw over your aptitude tests they tend to give you a whole gamut of uh, suitable professions ranging from author to scientist what it also does is that it lets you appreciate artificial logic languages a little bit more and helps you possibly develop a penchant for say software programming so it was that i took up computer science in school and uh, did passively well at it and wanted to continue doing this for a living then college happened and uh, so did instrumentation and control which is quite a huge departure from software programming and was not really the field of choice for me but uh, i've managed to stay loyal to my first love as it were while not abandoning my karma bhumi entirely so the rest of the talk is going to be about that so let's get to it okay so one thinks the only thing one needs to do to do engineering in india is get into a halfway decent college and then you're set for life but that's not really the case at least not for us poor little souls who don't manage to land the stream of our choice so what does one do that way when one is interested in coding and gets pushed into a branch that is nowhere related to it what does one do then well let me tell you first hand experience coming across software projects when the stream of engineering you're doing is nowhere related to software can be a herculean task it is very difficult to come across guides who are willing to give you software projects when they know that you have absolutely no experience in the same uh but uh, luck providence god the flying spaghetti monster call it what you will favored me and uh, soon a classmate and i were doing a project with a faculty mr anand gupta here related to graphics so moving on to that octrees and dynamic scene management this was my first project here and um, this basically involved management of a scene which had some moving objects now octrees are tree structures data structures uh, i suppose most of us here are familiar with binary trees that is each node of the tree has two children now an octree is basically a generalization of the same wherein each node of the tree has eight children nodes uh it's also a 3d data structure so it's very good for mapping spatial scenes especially 3d scenes which we were dealing with in this project um uh, we had a little bit of work already done in the area to go back on now let me point out that uh, the paper which dealt with this work um was written by a three presuming three very well meaning chinese gentlemen but uh, they didn't realize that uh, using the google translation tool for translating from chinese to english would translate into a huge headache for us later readers of their paper uh, however we managed to somehow make sense of their paper and uh, realized that what they had basically done was use octrees which had nodes like this now this is one node and its eight child nodes are the nodes that you get by slicing along those planes when you basically slice a cube in three dimensions you have three mutually perpendicular planes and you get eight smaller cubes now those eight smaller cubes are your child nodes of the bigger node now what they had done was if they had say a bunny and a dragon in a scene and they wanted to interchange the two what they would do was take a small node to house the bunny a big node to house the dragon and then during movement in order to preserve the seamlessness of the background they would resize the nodes now that obviously took a huge toll on system resources because it was being done at run time obviously now i will not pretend to have done anything majorly path breaking what we figured was that if we could somehow remove this aspect of resizing of nodes we could come up with better time complexity for the system 
So basically, we just did something as simple as making the smallest node of the scene large enough to house the dragon itself. So what happened was the bunny was in a huge node, as large as the dragon. But when you had to interchange them, you didn't have to resize. You simply had to move this huge node right over there and that huge node over here. It didn't make a difference, but it brought down the time complexity by about 25%, which was great. So we also wrote a paper on this, which was uh, presented at the IEEE INMIC conference in 2008. Uh, buoyed by the rather unexpected success of this algorithm, we decided to go a bit further and uh, come up with an algorithm that did not really affect the space complexity as much as the previous one was. The previous one, if you remember, was using the smallest node to house the largest object. The node size was equal to that of the largest object in the system. Now, while space constraints are not really encountered in today's computing systems, it's really not the way to go when you know your smallest unit of the system is using a whole lot of unnecessary space. So what we did was, this time, we made the node size equal to that of the smallest object in the system. That helped us make it something like the dragon would be large enough, but it would be made up of n number of nodes. Now all those nodes would be connected by an identifier that was unique to the dragon. Now this way, we figured the space complexity would not be affected, and the time complexity would remain just as good. I suppose we were a little bit too ambitious in trying to send it for a transaction, and the IEEE obviously rejected it on the grounds of it not being a novel enough idea. Of course, uh, this restored our faith in the IEEE. It showed that they were not blind enough to be accepting just about anything. And it ended up being more of a psychological experiment rather than, an, uh, uh, rather than a technical idea presentation. So this led us to a new project on text conversion. Now, this was basically a natural language processing project that uh, stemmed from a need for an intelligent OCR that could actually recognize handwritten uh, notes, as it were. I think most of us would know that scanning notes right one day before an exam is a big headache if you have turned on the OCR and realized it 10 pages into the scanning. So that was uh, something we were working on. But uh, however, uh, Mr. Anand Gupta had to take a brief hiatus from college. So that project has been shared and is available to any of you should you choose to go ahead with that. Plagiarism charges will not be leveled. Don't worry. Moving on, uh, NLP led me to artificial intelligence. And uh, I worked on an independent project uh, regarding an AI Autobot, which was similar to the text conversion one in that it was supposed to read out uh, numerals and uh, alphabets written on square LED or LCD matrix displays. Now, you could use that, uh, say, in bus stops to read off numbers off of buses. And uh, the special thing about this was that it could also function in noisy environments and could be a great boon for the visually challenged. This used neural networks, which then, uh, this is, say, an O in pristine conditions, and that is a noisy O, and the system could recognize both of them as O under 90% of the situations. So something like this would be a great boon for somebody who could not read those numbers. Moving on from AI. Uh, I went to my first uh, control systems project, which was for an unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, this project involved fuzzy logic, which is another um, uh, type of logic that is frequently encountered in uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, this project, while it encountered many obstacles, like the lack of a model for the system, was completely uh, finished. But of course, it was not good enough to be used in, say, defense applications, because it was, uh, well, more uh, focused on being cost-oriented rather than, uh, well, uh, efficiency-oriented. But it could be used for some basic surveillance, as if, if you wanted some models of buildings from uh, an aerial viewpoint, you could use this. Then we come to the nonlinear control using hidden Markov models, which is uh, my BTEC project, which I'm currently working on. Uh, this, again, is uh, a very highly specific control systems project, but involves a whole lot of programming and math. Uh, now, a hidden Markov model is a doubly stochastic embedded process. That is, um, say you're outside of a room, and inside the room are some n balls like this, each of them having colored balls. 
and somebody throws out a ball from some random ball. It could be a green ball or a red ball or a yellow ball. All you can see is the color of the ball. You don't know which ball it has come from and you don't know which color will come next. The thing a uh, hidden marker model chooses to model is a system exactly like this, uh, where you don't know which ball it is and you don't know the color of the ball. So you have two layers of stochasticity. And this makes it very useful for modeling some system that has some inherent chaos or nonlinearity. And this is what we're doing currently, and uh, this is a project in progress. And the final implementation for this will be in hardware. And it was this, but not just this, that led me to consider doing a project in hardware. Uh, I think my college mates would agree that uh, probably the most famous triumvirate in NSIT belongs to the ECA department. And uh, it would have been uh, quite a crying shame to not have done a project with any one of them in four years. Uh, so it was thus that uh, I, along with a classmate, whatever else I might say, I did not have the guts to do this on my own, approached Professor Dhananjay Gadre for a project in hardware, which is a pulse oximeter. Uh, a pulse oximeter basically uses light to measure the level of oxygen in your bloodstream. Uh, the level of oxygen can be used to diagnose a various range of uh, diseases and is also used to measure the amount of anesthesia one might need in uh, highly specific conditions. Uh, this has been done before, but the implementation from earlier has relied on MATLAB and computers. We chose to go with just a microcontroller, a wooden clip with LEDs on it, and that's it. The computer part has been eliminated, making it very much cheaper uh, from lakhs of rupees to about some hundreds of rupees, the BOM has come down. And uh, it becomes much accessible and portable, which means that in the case of a dire emergency, you can totally hook it up to the patient and get readings like this. On the other hand, if you have a computer system, there are n levels of redundancies that you need and n levels of places where things might go wrong. So this is much better for that. This is again, you know, uh, an awesome project under construction. So that's about it. Um, this is what all I've been working on. Uh, the common thread, obviously, is that all of these projects involve some amount of coding or the other, which, as I mentioned, is what I love doing. Uh, the thing is that in four years, it has been a conscious choice to choose projects that have some amount of software. Of course, the hardware one was uh, very specifically taken up for the hardware. and. Uh, even though I did not realize that it would have some coding in it, as it happens to. But uh, some, uh, whenever I've had a choice, I have chosen to go with the software part of things and not, say, with the hardware or the control systems part of things. It has been a conscious choice because it has been, uh, well, my field of choice. I have, been, I have come into instrumentation not by choice, but because of necessity, if you will. And, uh, this presentation was basically to show that sometimes you know you do end up coming into a field that you didn't want to come into in the first place, but you can still do what you like doing, provided you take